Uh, I'm happy to welcome one of our keynote speakers at work, Economic Summit 2012, Mr. Yebsa, uh, who is Deputy Director General of World Trade Organization. Good morning. Pleasure, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, you've been with us most of the weekend, so can you share impressions about the Economic Summit? Well, it's a very interesting event. You have a very good list of speakers, uh, some really interesting discussions. Uh, a lot of things about current uh, economic, financial, and trade issues, but also a lot of uh, people who are talking about uh, more theoretical issues about the, the world economy, about human behavior and economics, uh, about a, a number of topics. I found it a very interesting conference. Well, well, uh, well done. Very good uh, preparation and planning by the by the people who put it on. Thank you very much on behalf of the whole organization team. But I would also like to mention that you attended the dinner and dance yesterday, so how yes. was that? Great. I mean, uh, I'm not much of a dancer, but I enjoyed the dinner. And uh, it was certainly good to exchange ideas and thoughts with uh, some of your students and some of the speakers. Uh, it's not bad to sit at a table with a Nobel Prize winner, so uh, that was a pleasure. Great. I am sure then we'll welcome you some other time again. And I would just like to ask you a couple of questions about current events and of course World Trade Organization. What I found quite interesting in your previous work is uh, an interesting syntagma of happy paradox of the increase in wealth on the one hand and then increase in awareness of environment problems. So could you maybe further expand on that idea and also in the context has World Trade Organization done enough uh, for preventing and keeping the environment? Well, I think that obviously uh, there is always an inherent tension between uh, those who want to see economic gain and those who want uh, to protect the environment. But I think what's happened uh, over recent years is an increasing awareness on the part of people in uh, positions like mine of the need for uh, sustainable development, sustainable economic growth, uh, the need to find ways of promoting uh, more environmentally friendly technologies, for example, uh, in the negotiations we, we have been having in, in the WTO, in the Doha round, this has been a theme. How can we create uh, more trade in environmental goods? Uh, that is, the kinds of products that help to uh, remedy environmental problems or that have uh, uh, you know, good uh, effects in sustainability. For example, uh, wind ener energy project products or solar products. Uh, so there is, I think, a, a very much an increasing awareness on the part of, of those in the trade policy field that we're not going to be able to, uh, to take advantage of the Earth's resources forever without uh, finding uh, some way to, to marry up economic growth with sustainability. I do think that uh, some people believe that uh, trade agreements or trade liberalization might be uh, inimical to, to environmental progress. But actually, if you look at the record, uh, it is really the countries that are advancing and developing the most with higher standards of living where the public in those countries begin to demand uh, better uh, sustainability, better environmental policies. So really, in a way, the mission of the WTO, of course, is, is to help to generate uh, income, growth, and, and development. And uh, what we see is as countries become more successful in world trade, they also become more affluent. As they become more affluent, they begin to care more about the environment. In line with this topic, uh, there is a quite a hot debate in European Union about whether all countries should contribute equally to protecting the environment. And on the other hand, of course, we have less developed countries uh, which are trying to use that period uh, of time to develop their economy first and then start thinking about environment. 
On the other hand, of course, more developed countries such as Germany, UK, uh, are refusing that proposal. So what's your opinion about that trade-off in terms of providing some time for less developed countries uh, to achieve higher level of economic growth and then start thinking about the uh, environment? Should that pattern be adapted, not only in EU, but globally? It's not it's not a central focus in, in WTO agreements, that is, the ability of developing countries to engage in more uh, uh, or less friendly, environmentally friendly uh, practices. That's, that's not necessarily our focus. I think our focus is to recognize that developing countries uh, do not have the same capacity as richer countries uh, to liberalize their markets. Uh, against foreign competitors uh, and th therefore, for example, in areas like, uh, like import tariffs or subsidies, they may have uh, more leniency from the WTO rules. But I think implicit in that is also the understanding that um, you know, spending money for environmental remediation, for uh, installing the kinds of technologies that, that, that factories uh, and power plants need to, to reduce uh, environmental uh, pollution uh, takes money. I mean, let's face it, it takes income, it takes growth in order to be able to uh, uh, successfully implement those kinds of policies. So there is some recognition, I think, perhaps, uh, in certainly in things like the climate change negotiations, that poorer countries need some policy space. I think the bigger question is, what about the big developing countries, uh, such as China, uh, which still have huge percentages of the population who are very poor, but who also have a lot of uh, resources at their disposal as a country, as a central government, to begin to uh, move towards uh, more, uh, more active environmental policies, uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, for example, and, and those kinds of things. I have to ask you one slightly controversial question. Yeah. I hope you won't mind. No, there is an increasing criticism of World Trade Organization as an institution, and for example, Michael Moore, a Moore, so filmmaker, not previous uh, president of the World Trade Organization, uh, has, is, has recently claimed in one of his interviews that World Trade Organization is just, uh, as he said, is exploiting uh, poor people in terms of labor force to preserve American status quo. I know that criticism is very high on his agenda, but how would you explain to random uh, people, so students and our viewers, that that is not true? The strongest support for the WTO these days often comes from the poorest countries. We have a very, very active and very, very uh, involved uh, group of countries uh, in the least developed country category. And their view is that actually, if you look at the rules of the WTO, it helps to level the playing field between the big, strong countries and the poorer players. And that uh, they are able, for example, to take big countries, big players like the United States or the European Union, to the WTO dispute settlement system if the rules are being violated, they are able to gain a great deal in terms of access to the markets of the big countries, which they wouldn't necessarily be able to do if we lived in a world of pure mercantilism and pure power. I think the question I'd ask Michael Moore is exactly what is his alternative? Uh, if you look at the, the rules of the WTO, uh, the basic principles are non-discrimination and national treatment. and the. The big powerful countries with high GDP owe that obligation to the poorest as well as owing it to other rich countries. So to me, really, uh, it's about leveling the playing field between rich and poor. Now there, there have been, historically in the WTO, some problems. The, the biggest problem comes from the fact that for many, many years before, before the WTO, when, when it was the old GATT, for many years, the, the real negotiations were only between developed countries. And so they traded uh, concessions with one another. They traded 
tariff reductions, and other commitments with each other. And this very often left the products of principal interest to the developing world off the table. And so we ended up with a, a kind of a patchwork quilt with higher import tariffs on products of, of most interest to the, to the poor countries. That's a lot of what the Doha round of negotiations has been about correcting. And even before the Doha round, that process began in, in the previous round, the Uruguay round of negotiations, we eliminated uh, the long-standing system of protection for textiles and apparel. We eliminated many of the quota restrictions on those products. Uh, a lot of uh, the United States and the Europeans and others reduced their, their tariffs on textile and apparel products. And this led to a real explosion of growth and, um, and development in, in many uh, developing countries. I, I think the best answer to Michael Moore is if you actually look at the performance of those countries which are, those, those poorer countries which are the strongest adherents to the WTO, their economic growth has been uh, quite spectacular. Um, Africa now has growth rates of five and six percent uh, and this is in part because they're participating more in international trade, they're finding markets in, in the rich countries, and this is, uh, this is helping to lift people out of poverty. If you just take the record of Asia, where hundreds of millions of people have been brought out of poverty in recent years, uh, I think it's, it's hard to make the argument uh, that the WTO has really had the kinds of effects he's, he's suggesting. I think that will be more than sufficient explanation for all our viewers. And having such an expert in our provisional uh, economic summit studio, I would also like to ask you a couple of questions about current events. Sure. Uh, so at the last uh, World Economic Forum, George Soros uh, has claimed that uh, the euro has to survive, otherwise it will cause a meltdown of Europe. So in your opinion, are governments doing enough or they're just doing uh, a bigger, larger damage in long run? I'm very cautious as a WTO official to talk about the euro or to talk about exchange rates or currency uh, matters uh, and even to talk about the debt or financial policies of these countries. Those really aren't the core issues that, that countries uh, give the WTO competency to, to, uh, to deal with. Uh, but of course, we recognize that uh, both uh, debt and fiscal policy, uh, as well as exchange rates, have a, a big impact uh, on international trade. I think probably the best thing for me to say is that, uh, from the WTO perspective, uh, the, the the growth of the European Union, uh, the evolution of its uh, single currency have been positive factors for world trade. Uh, certainly the euro has become uh, one of the world's important currencies. And uh, if there is a significant uh, repercussions, if there are significant repercussions from the downturn in, in the European economy, uh, it will certainly be felt by those who export to Europe or those who depend on, on trade with Europe. So, you know, the best way to put it is we're hoping that the governments are doing uh, the best they can uh, to address the problem. But these are issues for the European Union and its member states to, to grapple with uh, and for us to uh, avoid uh, sitting in a position of, of criticism. And final question, some economists have already forecasted a new uh, crisis in a couple of years' time. Do you have any opinion on that? I tend to be much more optimistic. I think obviously this was a very scary period from, from 2008 uh, until today. We, we've had a lot of, of uncertainty. The financial crisis uh, followed by the debt crisis uh, in, in certainly in the developed world have, have been uh, things to, to cause great uh, concern. I think probably the, the most uh, promising uh, aspect of this that I can cite is that uh, despite the enormous downturn in world trade in 2009, right after the financial crisis, 
Uh, we've seen trade rebound now. Uh, we're seeing fairly stable uh, uh, growth in, in world trade. Uh, the, the figures for 2011 are not quite as impressive. But I, I think my, my main point is that uh, I think if the governments continue to focus on, on grappling with their, uh, their fiscal policy problems and continue adhering to uh, the, the principles uh, of, the, of the international system, that is uh, open trade, uh, non-discrimination, um, these will be uh, I think probably good uh, contributors to to stability, and I think ultimately we're going to come out of this crisis. And uh, whether whether it takes uh, another uh, few years to, to really see ourselves back on the kind of, of uh, pattern of growth we had before the crisis, uh, I'm, I'm still quite optimistic that that uh, that's that's what our future looks like. Thank you very much for your optimism and it was a real pleasure talking to you and listening to you at Foreign Economic Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.